to say this is not a movie where there's a good guy and there's a bad guy. You have to choose one person to cheer from for tonight. In this story, there are no good guys and bad guys. There are only good guys. The city of Raleigh is a good guy. It's doing exactly as it should. Taking the time out to determine the needs, what is best for its citizens and for the businesses here in the city of Raleigh. I started the process of putting the listing on Airbnb and what do you know, one of the first things that Airbnb tells you when you begin to create a listing is they say, you should check with your local city to find out if this is legal. So I did the right thing, I called the city. And I want to say that, to echo something that Garrett just said, my interactions with the city have been fantastic. With the zoning department, with the city council, I have to say I am so proud to be a citizen of Raleigh because of the way this has played out. But I called the city uh, zoning department, and here's what they told me, which they've also said in the News and Observer and other places. They said, you know, this Airbnb thing is, is pretty new, and we're not really sure if it's legal or not. But the truth is, we're not going to pull up the pages of all these people who are listing their places on Airbnb and then go after them and tell them to stop. We would never bother you unless someone had complained. And as we all know, as far as I know, there's been one complaint here in Raleigh. Uh, as Jeff said, there's about 300 homes sharing on Airbnb. One complaint, that's a pretty great average. The complaint was against Jody and I, and, and I guess that's why I'm here tonight. But the point I want to make is, since that issue became an issue with the city zoning department, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and talking with others about it in the community. And I want to make a single point here, and that is, as a journalist, as someone who has been part of the tech world in San Francisco and in New York, I think this is a hugely crucial issue for the city of, of Raleigh. It may not be a big issue in Garner, maybe in Garner it doesn't matter whether they have Airbnb or not, but I think here in Raleigh we have much bigger aspirations. We are a tech center, we are an innovation hub, and if you go to the city council's website, that's the first point on their mission statement, and that is who we are. And if that is who we are, we need to participate in that world, in that culture, and Airbnb is part of that culture. So I strongly believe that here in Raleigh, if we were to ban Airbnb, the city's efforts, for instance, like when Mayor McFarland went to South by Southwest last year with the team to recruit new tech companies to come here, those kinds of efforts, I believe, will fall flat on their face if after we try to recruit a company to move to Raleigh, the CEO of that company Googles Raleigh and sees that we've just banned Airbnb. It doesn't send the right message to the kind of companies we would want to recruit to come here. That's why this issue is so important to me. It's not about me renting out a spare bedroom in my house. It's not about others renting out spare bedrooms in their houses. It's about us having a healthy, vibrant, exciting, innovation center, tech hub city. That's who Raleigh is. That's who we want to continue to be. And this is one of those issues we've got to get right. And if we get it right, other cities will look to us and say, when they're facing the same issue, Hey, what did Raleigh do? What was the Raleigh plan? And that's what we want to be. We want to be leaders on this issue and leaders in the world of technology. Thank you. I had one job here tonight. One. And it was to introduce the panel. <laughs> I think I forgot my job. <laughs> so, with that, um, as we're waiting for Max um, from Airbnb, who we understand has just landed and is catching an Uber from the airport. <laughs> Yeah, right, you like that, okay. Now, I'm feeling the pinch because I'm a taxi cab driver. I'm the spokesperson for the Raleigh taxi cab industry. And you and Lynn have been manipulating our livelihoods by one, driving with private liability license plates with no commercial insurance on those vehicles. Anyone they pick up that has an accident, or a pedestrian that walks in front of them, they're in problems. They should be insured. They don't have background checks for the health, safety, and welfare of our population. They want the surge price of all of our consumers. I don't care if you're rich, middle class, or poor. You should be treated with proper dignity and respect and know what your, your obligations are economically. Airbnb is a platform, and everyone that operates on that is an individual business. So you're looking at, in Raleigh, about 300 small businesses that operate on the Airbnb platform. And by city council looking at possibly banning Airbnb, you're jeopardizing or putting in jeopardy 300 small businesses 
that are operating in, in Raleigh to be in the position where they have to shut down. Um, I think that's kind of a concern to a lot of small businesses that we don't want to put that negative uh, publicity in Raleigh. This zoning issue uh, in some neighborhoods, uh, or in all neighborhoods, businesses are not allowed, as we've already heard, uh, depending on what the traffic count and all those things are. So we'd have to overcome and change our zoning in our neighborhoods. I'm not sure if that's going to happen at this point. I do re agree with Greg that it is very important for us to have this conversation because we are a small business community. I am one of those myself, and uh, I support that as many of you already know. My questions are the regulations that you're willing to endeavor, is what I heard. Uh, we have a hotel and motel tax. You do not pay that, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not presuming you don't. Do they do that in other uh, cities? That would be a question that I would have. San Francisco. Rick, San Francisco. Rick, San Francisco. They, 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 they do. They do. They, so Airbnb they has already built that into their platform, so they really just need to get a green light from the city know what the taxes are, and essentially flip a switch. That tax would automatically be collected from the guests. Us as hosts would never touch it, and we go right to the city. So that issue is very easy to handle. Okay, well, there, there are a lot of these issues. There are a lot of comments about uh, sensible uh, regulations, uh, and I haven't seen any sensible regulations of government since I've been in it for 30 years. <laughs> Uh, you know, I want us to be careful about throwing around phrases like slum landlords. Woo! Uh, I live in Boylan Heights. I live next door to a house that was owned by a slum landlord. Boylan Heights has come back. Um, I appreciate city council people being here, but nothing was being done by the slum landlord of the house next door to us for a long time until a young family bought it and we did it. Um, we are 73 and 74. We live in a 100 and year old house. We would not to like downsize to assisted living or whatever. We were early adopters. We started in 2008. There were only two other listings. There were three listings. I want people to understand the safety devices that Airbnb has put into place. So I want you to go to the website and uh, educate yourself. Um, everybody is reviewed. We get reviewed as hosts. People that want to stay with us get reviewed as potential guests. We get to read their reviews. We are not going to become slum landlords. Airbnb hosts are not going to become slum landlords. We are very careful about who we say yes to. Right now we have a PhD candidate in electrical engineering from France staying with us. So we're going to be careful about who we allow to come into our house. And there are lots of safety uh, provisions included in Airbnb. So I want us to be careful about tossing around words like slum landlords. Airbnb is enabling us on a fixed income to stay in our 100-year-old house that we are stewards of. Thank you. I'm generally supportive of Airbnb, but I also am a neighborhood activist, and I just want to make sure that the city gets it right. With, and I believe there needs to be some regulations. For example, um, once the city implemented the PROC, which is the Probationary Rental Occupancy uh, Permits, we had a lot less problems with absentee landlords. So I believe some kind of regulation on the Airbnbs where people are accountable, I think that would give neighborhoods a lot of peace of mind. So there definitely needs to be some kind of um, regulations. Thirdly, I'd like to reinforce the point that the, the previous host made about um, there, there are those rules in there, there are those ways that you can go ahead and you can qualify the person who's coming into your home. It's me. I have no husband. I have no other person to go ahead and to back me. So I have to go ahead and be very careful about who I allow into my home as a housemate, whether that's for a day, 90 days, or a year. And with that, I want to be able to qualify that person. And by being able to go ahead and to talk with them on the phone, via Airbnb, by the way, no phone numbers are exchanged until after they're booked. Find out more about them, 
go ahead and have also something in there that I can call Airbnb, which I have on occasion if there's been an issue with a guest. We talked about whether things go well, right? And occasionally someone shows up and they're not quite all there, okay? And I need to get that person out of my house because I don't want to live with that. I am a non-smoking home. I am a drug-free home. I do not like people to drink in my home. I keep a very strict house. So, in the, to be able to go to the, I, I just not, I, that, that's my house. I mean, you see, I'm with my Pepsi. Okay? I mean, moderation in one thing is one thing, but, but when I don't want to have the ire of my neighbors, I want my neighbors to be comfortable, I want my house to be quiet, and I want things to be good. And the funds from Airbnb directly go back into improving my home. And so it's really important to me that sensible regulations are there and that the checks and balances of Airbnb are there. And I feel much safer using a public platform like this than using something like Craigslist for which to seek roommates. Thank you. Well, I think actually the better question isn't so much about regulation and what services are regulated. I look at this and say, how does the city of Raleigh actually leap ahead of other cities and embrace this as an opportunity? So San Francisco, for instance, hosts a number of major corporate conferences annually. Dreamforce, Oracle World, uh, the GDC conference, which is not my particular GDC, but it's a big gaming conference. Tens of thousands of people enter that area for a week of activities. The way that San Francisco has figured out to handle that influx of uh, stays, Airbnb. There's only so many rooms at the Marriott Marquis. There's only so many rooms at the Red Roof Inn. There are only so many rooms within 200 miles of downtown San Francisco. But Airbnb makes virtual rooms available for people to come in, sleep on floors, sleep on rooftops, sleep wherever they need to sleep to be able to take advantage of those types of events. So if Raleigh actually looks at this from, I think if we all as a community say, how do we embrace this from a positive and do more to attract bigger, better events by embracing something like this, Uber, Lyft, and other alternative services, think about how great that could be from a messaging perspective on a national and global stage. Instead of having a big conversation around how we tamp it down and put tons of rules in place, I'd love this conversation to be more about how do we use this in a productive, proactive way to make Raleigh a bigger, more vibrant, and attractive city to others. That's going to make us all more money, more opportunity, more of everything. Yeah, and just, just to piggyback off of that, uh, again, with this mentality of, of creating a business here locally and, and bringing on board in the next three months, probably five new hires from out, most likely outside of the city and state, when people come in to experience Raleigh, uh, people don't come in and say, let me stay at the, the, where's the nearest chain hotel, and then give me a list of the nearest chain restaurants. They come in to experience what the city truly has to offer, and, and being able to do so in this this sharing type community where people can come in and experience a real neighborhood in Raleigh and you know like historic Oakwood for example um, and, and experience local flavors be it at a Jewel or, or at a Vita Mondo or something like that I think that's what it's really important to get behind as a city is saying this is the first step into potentially bringing new full-time residents into this area um, by giving them a first-hand experience of what that local flavor is all about. And then they move in and fill up these 10,000 new apartments that are going in downtown. But giving them a feel for it firsthand before, you know, before they, they opt to move here from the way. The last time I checked, Raleigh had close to 930 hotel rooms inside the Beltline, which in respect to the population of our city, including Durham and Chapel Hill and RTP is not a lot. So I'm just wondering if the city has analyzed this on a business impact. We have the new conference center that is con con continuing to attract the business. And then along with RTP, how are we going to hedge that moving forward? And then with, our, with Airbnb, do you have any case studies about cities that have kind of like with Oracle Open World in San Francisco that have had to kind of impact that effect and what they have done and how Airbnb has had a positive or potentially neutral and negative impact there. 
So for the impact, we do. I think um, I don't have it on me, but we've done impact studies, and, and we just released one in Boston two weeks ago. We've released them in I think Los Angeles about four weeks ago. Um, different cities, different uh, both U.S. and internationally about what the impact is, what it means for tourism, what it means who they you know who are the demographics of who travels on it, you know who who uses it, income into the city, revenue what neighborhoods people stay in, how they tend to, you know, I think it was in Boston a few weeks ago, we did one, and about 70% of people stay out of traditional hotel districts. So that's on the website, and I'm happy to, like, connect afterwards and, and talk about different ones. Sure. I forgot the first part of your question. No, no, no I was just wondering if, if, to this point, we've talked about regulation, only regulation, and I'm just wondering if the city of Raleigh has really done any in-depth study into what the potential economic or business benefit would be to having something like an innovative company, Airbnb, come in and help us with a deficit in hotel stay that we already have. Councilman John Odo. Uh, I can answer the part about our deficit for beds. Uh, we do need more beds. We're doing a study right now, uh, and we're trying to get our convention center to another level, which I totally agree. Uh, so there are more needs for more beds. There's no doubt about that. So. This, this is where this conversation ought to be going to continue. We're doing a study on our hotels that are downtown, but we'll have that completed hopefully in the next three months. Uh, so that's the answer to our question. We, we are behind, we don't have enough beds. And we want more, especially if we're going to have our convention center go to the next level of what it might be. I own a small business downtown, I live downtown, I have a family downtown, and I own rental property downtown. So I'm kind of I cover a lot of these bases. We rent out one of our rental property units on Airbnb. It's phenomenal. Before we did it, we went and asked our neighbors, talked to all of our specific neighbors. My, one of my oldest little old lady neighbors, who I was so worried about, when I told her, do you know what she said? She said, well, honey, in the Depression, we all ran out. Yeah. <laughs> she thought that it was amazing that we had this service, because she said, you know, you used to rent out a room. You didn't know if a person was just dirty because they didn't have a job, or they were dirty because they were dirty. <laughs> so, I know we're talking about this as such an innovative thing, but really, Airbnb is just making it easier for people to do what they've always done, which is rent out space in their homes or in their rental properties in an easier way. I agree with that. So, that's it. I have a question. Shoot. Wherever that came from. Could the state, could the General Assembly move in and try to get in on this and get its hands on it and try to... Uh, <laughs> Shut it down or find a way to make money. Do you want to talk about this for Yeah, I think I recognize that voice. Yeah. <laughs> nice question. So I'm not gonna to, to the specific laws of the state, you know, I don't know offhand, but one of the challenges that we see, especially when it comes to local occupancy taxes or transient occupancy taxes or what you know they're called different things, different places, is that every city and county can often levy their own. And so one of the things that a state could, in theory, do that would be interesting would be to make it a singular process. But you know, we certainly haven't seen that yet at a state level. Um, but if a state wanted to come in and regulate this, I'm sure they could. I don't know anything about if that's something on their agenda or not, though. So a few weeks ago, the city council in San Jose passed um, what I think are some of the, the most progressive and, and, and kind of uh, in, some of the most well thought out rules around this, um, at least from to answer your questions, their rules were, were quite simple. It said, if you do this in your home while you're there, you can do this 365 days a year. What you do in your home while you're there is yours. Right? That's not gonna get into you know, people doing multiple apartments. If you're not there, you can do this 180 days a year. That allows you to make sure that you live there at least half the year. It's probably your primary, it could be your secondary residence, but it's some sort of primary or secondary residence, so it prevents you from doing this in 20 apartments. Uh, pay your transient occupancy taxes. And uh, the city planning commission is gonna come back in two years and review and see if it's all working. That's what they said. And for that, they've, they've basically legalized home sharing. So how long did that process take? Um, I wasn't involved in all of it, but I, it was, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, don't, I'm not. Don't quote you on no, this. Well, They're only just I know. So I thought, let me say about. I think it was about a six months thing of working with the, of the city council, thinking it through. I know the city planning commission went back and forth. Um, they made recommendations. There was. Uh, I did go out there for uh, the city planning commission hearing. So I, 
it was a good process. It was open. It was there were people who came and spoke on on all sides, the the opponents, the people in favor of it, and the city decided this is something that that they wanted to to work with. Some of the things we've seen in these studies are that people tend to stay longer and spend more. So they don't always spend more per day. It's actually sometimes people who stay in hotels sometimes spend more per day, but they you know, it's about two and a half to three days versus, you know, four to five days, at least in Boston and Los Angeles, and we sort of see that in a lot of cities. So people spend more, and we have a lot of hosts here, I'm sure a lot of hosts here, how many of you like tell your guests where to go shop or where to go eat or where to go, all the hands are up, right? So this is one of the things we see a lot of, which is people who make maps, who, who tell people where to shop, where to go, and so as a local ambassador for your community, Money's being spent in, in neighborhoods all over. And so that's one of the advantages. I'm sure, you know, there's at least, you know, twenty-five good stories here of some small business that that you have had guests go and love and come back and say, This is a great place I've been to. So those are the kind of um, advantages you see from from all home sharing. It's not just everything, it's all the companies that do this. 